uh, sort of putting this all together. Um, so, so during the, this presentation, uh, we'll talk about some risks of COVID-19 uh, and strategies to combat those risks. We've looked at the situation here at UI Music School in, in great detail. Uh, but you should understand that uh, much of the information that we're using uh, to base our assessments is preliminary information. Uh, we'll talk more about exactly what those data are a little bit later, but there's still a lot of unknowns in terms of both the risks and the risk mitigation strategies, the efficacy of those strategies. We've been very conservative in our estimates of risk, uh, but that doesn't mean that, um, that the risk is reduced to zero here. Um, so this is an outline of what we'll talk about. Uh, we'll start with an overview of COVID-19. We'll talk about evidence for um, aerosol production by winds, brass, and singers. Uh, we'll discuss some evidence for general and also musician-specific principles of aerosol mitigation. Dr. Stainer and Hoffman and I will talk about some of the specifics uh, of implementation of those ideas for uh, uh, here at UI. Um, so COVID-19, uh, I probably, uh, don't need to hammer it home too much, but it's a serious disease. Um, 174,000 deaths so far. We're at about 1,000 a day here in the U.S., unfortunately. Um, and asymptomatic or presymptomatic transmission is very important in this disease. That means people who don't have fever, who don't have cough, certain breath, any of those other symptoms, at least 40% and probably more, um, uh, are responsible for, for at least 40% uh, and probably more of the uh, infections. So it's a large driver of the infectiousness uh, of this particular disease. In June, uh, ideas of, about airborne spread led 239 scientists to sign on to a letter to the World Health Organization suggesting that this particular area needed a lot more study. Uh, there's a lot of pieces of evidence that uh, the spread of COVID occurs through the air um, from droplets uh, either larger droplets or from droplets that can be carried on ventilation currents. Uh, we're not going to talk about all the pieces of evidence there, um, uh, but the general idea is that this is riskiest indoors in areas where the ventilation is inadequate um, and in, in uh, close contact with lots of other people. So larger particles, uh, uh, respiratory droplets, tend to fall to the ground within a few feet. And, and a lot of times you'll hear these uh, referred to as droplets. But an aerosol is a particle which can travel on air currents and doesn't follow sort of a standard, you know, ballistic kind of trajectory to deposit on the surface. And aerosol scientists jokingly discuss whether uh, an airborne cow in a tornado constitutes an aerosol. But the point is just that there's no real size cut off uh, between droplets and aerosols. So aerosols tend to be smaller particles uh, on the order of microns. Um, but if disease is spread through this route of uh, particles that are carried on ventilation currents, then that's called airborne spread. And that's what we're concerned about in this case. Uh, and so now we'll talk about why we think that music making is probably riskier uh, than the background risk of other activities like going to the grocery store. So uh, this slide highlights a lot of what was known about aerosol production from singers and instrumentalists before the pandemic. Um, the figure on the left is from a 2019 paper uh, by Asadi, and you can see here that the number of aerosols, which is on the y-axis, um, uh, increases as the loudness of speaking increases. That's on the x-axis, moving from left to right. Um, you can also see that there are outliers, which are the red plus signs um, uh, in the figure uh, uh, just under where it says speech. And that represents 12 to 20% of the population who are what's called super emitters. These are people who produce several times more aerosols than others while they're speaking or breathing or both. And we don't know why this happens or who these people are, but um, uh, they might be associated with some super spreading events like the Skagit Choir case uh, in Washington, where over half of the choir was infected during a two and a half hour choir practice. So there was early concern during uh, this uh, pandemic about choirs, um, uh, but the only wind instrument, if it could be called that, uh, that had been studied in the context of aerosol creation was the Vuvuzela, which is a straight pipe noisemaker uh, on which excited sports fans can uh, buzz their lips and make, make a lot of noise. Uh, 
Um, this work, which is from 2011, uh, showed dramatically more aerosol production from the Vuvuzela than from other sources like coffee. Uh, and you can see that in the figure on the right side. Um, the uh, playing the Vuvuzela is in the uh, dark colored um, uh, uh, icons and then uh, 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 shouting is in the light, lighter, uh, the non-filled icons. Um, so work that I did with uh, Dr. Hoffman here at the University of Iowa shows similar laryngeal activity in wind players compared to singing, except for actual phonation, of course. Uh, so the idea that winds and singers are similar, combined with this previous data on the Bubuzela, led to concern for, uh, for wind instrumentalists also. And so now we'll start looking at some of the data which are specific to musicians. And here I want to point out that the data are collected from various unpublished, non-peer-reviewed sources. Uh, and this is a disclaimer that was put out by the, the researchers in Boulder, Colorado, um, uh, as they discussed their results on a webinar. And, and they say, normally, we do not release data until they've been quality assessed and peer-reviewed. And that's an important part of the scientific process, and it's, it's one that's not uh, occurring in this case, uh, largely because these data are so fresh and new, and also because the studies are incomplete. But we'll look at a few of the pieces of evidence that we have. So um, it turns out that the, that the concerns about aerosol production were largely well-founded and have been confirmed by um, a number of different studies that have happened here in the U.S. and around the world. So this figure is from the Boulder Group's uh, early measurements of aerosol production. Uh, by a non-operatic singer, and the spikes indicate that aerosols are being produced. Um, and if you look at the scale uh, on the y-axis, you can see that the scale goes from 0 to 80 in this case. If we compare it here to the clarinet, um, also measured by the same group in Boulder, uh, the y-axis goes from zero up to 800, and you can see that these are spikes. And this is uh, uh, spikes of aerosol activity measured uh, in a, a clarinet player. And the peaks are, are dramatically more than reading or breathing for the same individual, uh, and many times more than the previous singing example, just based on that scale that I, that I pointed out. And so if we look at, you know, as I mentioned, this has been uh, investigated all around the world, and actually most recently, just yesterday, which is not included in this uh, uh, summary, there was an, uh, an additional study uh, looking at singers in particular uh, out of Britain also. Um, but, but there's several studies that are currently studying aerosol production from winds, brass, and vocalists. This chart uh, includes only those studies which looked at aerosols and small particles, not the ones that looked at airflow like some of the early studies that you might have heard about from Vienna and Bamberg. Uh, and there was one from Berlin as well that looked at airflow. Um, that's not included here because that's not really what we're interested in. Um, it, there's differences in the methodology uh, of these studies, so they can't be directly compared. And there's differences in the rank order of what's worse between singing, instrumentalists, and speaking, and breathing heavily or regular breathing. Uh, but there are some similarities between these studies as well. So I want to point out uh, all of the researchers who have released results thus far have investigated professional or collegiate level performers only. Although Colorado State University is planning to include some beginners as well, they actually have a, a webinar a little bit later on today uh, where I hope they might discuss some of those results. Uh, but the key takeaway point is that all of these studies support the idea that wind, brass, and singing performance produces aerosols. So if these aerosols are infectious, like if you have an infectious performer, then we have to acknowledge as a starting off point that the risk of performing on winds and brass and singing during the pandemic is higher than the baseline risk. And mitigating the risk is not covered by federal, state, local, or standard university guidance. Because the assumption is, with all of that guidance, the assumption is that you're not going to be sharing a space with someone who's potentially unmasked and producing aerosols for long periods of time. The closest government guidance we have comes from the CDC, who talk about K through 12 education. They say if mitigation strategies, meaning distancing, masking, et cetera, if the mitigation strategies can't be implemented, then activities should be limited or canceled. For higher education, the CDC mentions music specifically uh, for areas with minimal to moderate community transmission, which is most of the US at this point. Uh, 
uh, to consider canceling or modifying courses where students are likely to be in very close contact such as music. So what can we do to modify things uh, to mitigate the risk? So I, I should mention here, so there are ways to make music and have uh, performance courses, um, you know, virtually, as some of you have been doing and, and uh, some of you will continue to do. There are technological solutions to audio lag, um, uh, which can be a problem with, with uh, uh, some of the uh, virtual uh, performance. Um, and everyone's tolerance of risk and everyone's tolerance of uncertainty is different. And people have different real risks from coronavirus, should they be infected based on their age and a host of other factors. And the risk benefit calculation is a very personal one, uh, which um, if you think about a person's autonomy and, and autonomy and medical decision making, um, uh, people often uh, should get to make those kinds of decisions for themselves. Um, but it's a complicated decision. And so there's plenty of people who are gonna be teaching uh, uh, and performing in person this year. Uh, and so we should talk about uh, what we know about mitigating uh, the risks of wind blasts and singing performance. <clears throat> and uh, ventilation is really one of the most important elements uh, for reducing risk from aerosols. So replacement of indoor air with fresh outside air by being outdoors on a breezy day, for example, by opening a window or with the equivalent and filtered air uh, is essential. And this computer model illustrates a single singer in the middle of a well-ventilated room at three air changes per hour. Focusing on the top row, uh, an unmasked singer shows that at 30 minutes, the increased risk stays within a two meter radius of the singer. At 60 minutes, the risk extends to the corners of the room. Um, now this is a, a very constrained model uh, that's put out by researchers at University of Maryland and was included if some of you have been following the NFHS and CBDNA um, uh, uh, presentations. Um, the Maryland group is part of um, uh, the group that, that, uh, uh, that is putting on those presentations. So, but you should note the disclaimer that they put uh, uh, in their uh, slides as well. So they say, don't rely on this without experimental data because we're dealing with phenomena here that as they say, threaten human life. And the disclaimer really exists for a good reason. So other models predict different risks. There's a computer model from Minnesota that shows that risks vary based on where return vent is in the classroom. So for example, if the teacher is infected and speaking without a mask, um, and if the vent is near the front of the room by the teacher, then the students are safe. But if the vent's in the back of the room, then the students near the back are at risk. And these researchers found that vortices and dead zones of ventilation can lead to hot spots for aerosol collection, regardless of the number of air changes per hour in the space. And this was most marked in their simulated elevator where most of the aerosols were deposited on the walls, even though the air was theoretically changed uh, every few minutes. And the distance recommendation that was put out by the Boulder researchers, which is six foot distancing, except uh, more for trombone, uh, that was largely from the Maryland simulations. And it's really important to understand that uh, while it sounds similar to the six foot distancing that was recommended by the CDC and other groups, it's for completely different reasons. So the standard six foot guidance is based on the idea that the large heavy particles or droplets fall from the air over distance and time. They don't often travel uh, beyond six feet. But smaller particles or micro droplets, like we talked about, uh, these aerosols, um, often linger in the air and can ride air currents. And this figure uh, illustrates how droplets of different sizes can travel over time in a simulated room with different levels of ventilation. So the larger droplets, which are in the, illustrated in the right two panels, um, don't generally go beyond two meters. They stay fairly close to the source. Uh, the smaller droplets, uh, which could be called aerosols in the left two panels, uh, travel throughout the room. And in general, then, a larger distance between musicians means less risk, uh, in part because that limits the number of players, like the physical space limitation, uh, but also in part because a gradient of decreasing aerosol concentrations should occur with increasing distance. The, but that's with the caveat of what we talked about uh, just a couple of slides ago about the ventilation systems. And there's two main ways that time affects risk. And first, uh, in general, less time exposed means a lower dose of exposure. So dose corresponds to infection risk and infection severity, 
and less time means less risk of severe infection. Um, and then the second way that, that time affects things is that uh, aerosol concentration varies with time. So the graph on the bottom, uh, you'll probably get to hear more about later, but this was developed by Dr. Stanier when he was looking at our practice room uh, situation in, uh, uh, at uh, UI. Um, and so you can see that over time, which is on the x-axis, the aerosol concentration, which is the y-axis, uh, changes dramatically. Um, and he'll talk to you more about uh, uh, you know, exactly how he, he calculated all those things. Uh, the point, though, is, is that there's a number of variables involved, including um, uh, the particular ventilation systems uh, of those spaces. Uh, and so calculating this out is really non-trivial. And it's something that uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about. So uh, now we'll talk about some mitigation ideas that are specific for musicians. And so uh, HEPA filtration close to the source of aerosol production was studied by Dr. Wong's group in Cincinnati. Um, and he had uh, markedly good results, although he only tested two singers uh, with the HEPA filtration. The tests were done in a fairly large studio room. They had six air changes per hour. Uh, but the aerosol concentration was several times less with the HEPA filter close to the singer compared to without, um, as measured not only at the performer, but also six and 10 feet away. Unfortunately, we don't have a measurement of the level of background aerosols with only the HEPA filter running, which would have made the interpretation a little bit easier. Um, and then there's three interventions which were recommended by the Boulder team that I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about. Uh, first, the idea of modified masks. So these are masks with a slit in them that allow for passage of a mouthpiece or a reed. And these were tested on seven wind and brass performers. Um, and the results I highlighted in arrows here. Uh, one of these, the oboe player, uh, didn't tolerate the mask. One of them, the trumpet player, uh, aerosol production increased with the mask. And then for two woodwind players, there was a slight decrease. And then for three of the brass players, there was a decrease that I would call easily noticed, noticeable from uh, this graph. Now, it's important to note, there haven't been any statistics done on this. We, we you know, there's some theoretical uh, reason why the mask might help protect the wearer, even though there's a hole in them. They might catch emissions which pass around the amateur or leak through the nose. Uh, they might make it easier to remain masked during rest or breaks in playing, which is really important. Uh, but the data on whether they decrease aerosol emissions during performance uh, is quite mixed. Uh, for masks for singers, so the Boulder researchers studied one singer and one orator uh, with well-fit masks made from surgical grade material. Um, the, the folks in Cincinnati said that they talked with their um, uh, singers and their singers didn't want to wear any masks. So there's some differences there. The other thing is well-fit masks, it, it's important to uh, realize that these are the kind that leave an impression around your mouth uh, uh, when you take them off. Um, we know that a lot of masks don't do that, but that, that's what well-fit means. So the results aren't that surprising. Um, if you have a well-fit mask, then masking helps. Uh, but please be careful if you're thinking about masks for singers that, that they have to be the kind that would allow for a well-fit seal. Uh, Dr. Vulcans from Colorado State University um, uh, studied some of these uh, masks that are being advertised as singers' masks. Uh, and in particular, some of them have some space around the, the back. Um, and during his study, he found that they weren't uh, particularly effective. And I think that um, he'll describe more about that um, if you have a chance to see him uh, speak uh, later today. Uh, the data on bell covers is a bit more consistent, um, especially for brass players. So from Boulder, the data uh, remain somewhat mixed, for woodwinds especially. Um, and they haven't yet tested their uh, recommended construction, which is 2 pi 80 denier nylon sandwiching a MERV 13 filter. But there are data from a British uh, brass band, which is in the lower right of the screen, uh, which consistently show a reduction in aerosol size particles 
uh, from seven uh, musicians playing brass family instruments using spun cotton bell covers. So shields are pictured here. This is from the West Point band rehearsals. Um, shields can protect against larger droplets, but um, they won't be particularly effective against uh, aerosols that can ride air currents around them. You can imagine if someone's smoking in the same room as you, uh, even if you're separated by a plexiglass shield, you'll still smell the smoke and smoke consists of aerosols. And so the idea is that aerosols won't necessarily uh, respect the barrier uh, of the shield. Now, there's a number of behaviors that are associated with music performance which have some potential uh, for additional risk. And I would suggest that these are some of the ones that winds and brass players in, in particular are going to have to um, pay, pay particular attention to because they're so automatic and they're just kind of automatically ingrained in what we do as we're performing in the orchestra. You hear, you know, you feel a little something in your tone hole, you just whip around your instrument and start blowing it out. Um, I think it's very difficult to get out of that muscle memory, but it's going to be pretty important. So no, nobody should be blowing out spit valves or tone holes during a pandemic. Um, catching the passive release of spit into a Lysol soap pad contained in a zipper baggie uh, will likely reduce the risk. For tone holes, there's cigarette paper or those absorbent microfiber pads. Um, instrument swabs should be treated with care. Uh, ideally, they should be laundered regularly, although I can't say I know the last time I laundered my swab. But um, Now, feathers, uh, I don't know if any of your students use feathers, but they could theoretically increase the risk as they spring back into shape when they come out of an instrument. But you know, none of these behaviors or these interventions have actually been studied. It, it's all essentially conjecture. Um, sharing instruments. Uh, many of you have had questions about sharing instruments. It becomes problematic in the short term for winds and brass uh, because it's difficult to clean woodwind instruments, although the brass uh, instruments can be given a bath. Um, some period of time for air drying between students would likely help decrease the risk. Um, it can be difficult to assure social distancing during movements on and off stage, so that's something that the ensemble directors uh, will have to pay special attention to. Um, normally, you might not think twice about asking your students to sing in a class with theory or ear training, uh, but during this time, um, you should think twice about doing things like that, uh, especially when singing can make up a, a significant part of the, of the activities that you're doing. Um, and then, you know, buzzing mouthpieces, that's something that's probably particularly high risk at spreading aerosols and droplets. Uh, and then there are some extended techniques. So researchers in Minnesota looked at a couple of different extended techniques for the flute. Uh, they looked at a, a, a ram tongue, like a hard tongue, and then a jet whistle, uh, and found that both of those increased uh, aerosol production by many times, even 50 times or more, um, uh, over the uh, standard um, uh, aerosol production. So uh, extended techniques should really be kind of considered uh, uh, differently. And then I'd like to start to discuss some of our process here at the University of Iowa. Uh, and uh, Dr. Stane and Dr. Hoffman are gonna jump in as well. Uh, but this is just kind of a uh, introduction to the kinds of things that, that we were able to do here. Um, and uh, Tammy really determined uh, early on that, that uh, she had to load the boat, uh, meaning uh, get the right people to the table. And because we were able to uh, help describe how music making is, is an edge case, we had tremendous amount of support, not only from Tammy, uh, but also the university administration and the whole UI community, um, uh, and even the broader community as well. So we were able to get together building engineers, uh, including uh, the box and ventilation system designer, Dwight Shum, uh, facilities management, including Tom Straubach and Katie Wasman. Uh, aerosol expert Charlie uh, Stainer, who you'll hear from today, uh, bioaerosol expert Matt Noneman, physicians including myself, Dr. Hoffman, who you'll hear from, uh, Dan Dikema, and Val Sheffield's testing lab. All these folks came together to offer their, their time and expertise uh, for the UI music community. And so there's some, some basic principles that, that we um, uh, that we thought about 
And so one of those is, is what I call stacking solutions. And so there's some interventions like increasing distancing, decreasing time of exposure, decreasing number of people, increasing ventilation, serial testing. These uh, interventions are very likely to um, reduce risk. And knowing how much to do those things really requires the expert consultation that we had. Some of the interventions like bell covers or modified masks might redu reduce risk. Uh, we're not quite sure how much or how. Um, but the idea of stacking them is that when you put them together, uh, the risk reduction is additive. So even though we don't necessarily know the absolute risk reduction from any particular intervention, um, when we add them all together, we hope that we can get to an acceptable level. And in some cases, we were able to get to a level of risk that, that we were comfortable with. But in some cases, we weren't. Uh, and Dr. Stane will talk a little bit more about that. There is a concept uh, that if it works, then we might never know. Uh, but if it doesn't, then we'll know for sure because people get sick. Um, we're looking into other ways to know if it's working. And so um, uh, testing is definitely a part of that. We might be able to do some other things um, uh, as well. And so uh, I'll give just uh, one example of some specifics from UI and then uh, Dr. Hopkins will, will jump in. So. Um, some of you might have seen this slide before, but uh, uh, when I was first approached by the, the music school, I thought that we were just gonna be able to plug in number of air changes per hour and figure out how safe a particular situation was, maybe add some extra ventilation uh, or HEPA filtration to a room. Um, but what wound up happening is I wound up learning more about ventilation systems than I ever thought that there was to know. Uh, so, um, Dr. Stan will, will talk more about particulars, uh, but in the practice rooms, for example, you can see we tested uh, the practice rooms with nebulizers and particle counters um, in the pictures on the right of the screen. And then another example is from the large stage in Boxman on the left side. Um, this is, so, so, so the particulars of the ventilation system here. So this uses the type of ventilation that's called displacement ventilation system. You've probably all seen the little um, vents on the bottom of each chair uh, in the audience. And then uh, that's supposed to push air uh, uh, up and forward uh, to the return that's back behind the stage. Uh, it's, the numbers tell us that the maximum is around three air changes per hour uh, with only about 30% coming from outside air. Uh, and the remainder being filtered. But because of the system design, it actually stays layered. And so um, uh, the air doesn't mix completely. Um, uh, the uh, ventilation designer told us that we should get about 12 air changes per hour delivered to head height on the stage, which is a phenomenal number. Um, but in our testing, we cranked up the ventilation system. We used bubbles and smoke, and we saw that the smoke and bubbles were staying uh, largely stagnant on the stage. Uh, you can see some of those pictures on the left side there. And so, you know, there's some possible reasons for this. Maybe there were fewer heat sources on the stage, uh, fewer warm bodies, um, leading to changes in the expected convection currents, which tend to drive ventilation. And we still need to look at it more. But in the interim, we, we really sort of changed the, our ideas about what we thought was possible for the number of folks who might be producing aerosols uh, on that big stage. Um, that's just one example, but uh, now Dr. Hoffman will um, talk about some of the testing. Great, thanks, Adam. I wanted to thank Tammy for letting me get involved in this wonderful project and be in the presence of greatness. Best guitar player I've ever seen play, Steve Grismore. Thanks for being here. A fantastic group of people you have assembled. Um, I just wanted to say that the only thing you can really say conclusively um, uh, that will be true uh, a week from now that's true today is that we don't know what's going to be true the following week. We just, what we say today will be changing. If you look in the Iowa Press Citizen from this morning at six o'clock, there's an article about a student that tested positive, had a terrible experience in her quarantine dorm, and this has gone viral, and it's the kind of thing that could make uh, the entire project of reopening the University of Iowa close down again. So I think one of our strategies or one of the things we have to think a lot about is not if, but when people are tested positive, what are we going to do and how do we uh, adapt thinking that perhaps um, we'll have to close down and reopen. So this is all very worthwhile. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Val Sheffield, one of the uh, members actually of our department, 
who has made available uh, testing now for selected uh, musicians in the School of Music. And I believe, Adam, you can correct me about this. You've been over to his lab. But I believe it's uh, just the woodwinds and the brass players and the singers that now will have the capability of being tested twice a week with testing that's done in a manner that's hopefully acceptable to all of them. A lot of people really don't like the probe up through their nose for the nasal pharyngeal swab. And this is a test that just recently was validated um, by the FDA emergency use authorization uh, to have a spit into a cup be tested, which still, even though it's relatively inexpensive compared to the swab, can be made even less expensive by doing what we call batch testing or pooling. And that's where you get a group of uh, 10 students that all have samples that are pooled together. A single test is run on that group of 10. If it's negative, they're all negative or you assume they're negative. And if it's positive, then you have to test them individually. So that's a program that should be starting relatively soon, but does really need to be interpreted in light of the concept of uh, false negatives. So a false negative means that the test comes up negative, but the person is still um, infected or infective. And it's actually more important not that to know if they're infected or not, but to know if they are infective to others around them. There's a good study from uh, Johns Hopkins that identifies when you're exposed to COVID, say that's day one, the typical onset of symptoms uh, occurs on day five. And so your testing is different on day one, two, three, and four, and five when your symptoms finally uh, begin. So in their analysis, 100% of those people that are tested on day one uh, have false negatives, meaning that even though they've been exposed, they have the virus that's gonna grow in them, none of them are gonna be tested positive. And as you get closer to day five, the false negative rate goes down, meaning that those that are infected will start to show up. But when their symptoms start, there's still a substantial false negative rate of 38% that goes down to 20% by day eight. So this testing is good if it's done in a repeated fashion, perhaps uh, twice a week, I think is what Val Sheffield's lab is gonna permit, in that your chance of slipping through is quite a bit less. Here at the university, before we operate on anybody, they have to come in the day before now to be tested uh, for COVID. And if they're positive, of course, we put them off unless it's an emergency. If it's an emergency, then we make adaptations. So we have some sense of reassurance that they, their viral load is sufficiently low that we can't detect it. And that gets the difference between being infective and being infected. So if they actually have the virus, but we can't detect it, it's possible that they're not infective at that point, but they will be in another two or three days, which really harkens to the repeated serial testing that's now uh, being made available. And I know Adam has been over to Val Sheffield's lab, and I could turn it over to Adam to talk a little bit about the, the process and how you've gone with volunteers from the music school to be trained to actually do that. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Hoffman, for helping set all that testing up. Um, uh, I think uh, Tammy will probably have more details on the specific group from the specific group who is going over for training uh, in uh, uh, Sheffield Lab pretty soon. But the basic idea is that the uh, samples will be uh, collected by the individuals um, uh, at home. Uh, they'll have a little uh, sample collection kit, uh, and then they'll be brought to a central location. Um, then once uh, uh, all, you know, 100 or however many people it is, uh, will uh, 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 deliver their samples twice weekly to that central location, then uh, they'll be taken over to Dr. Sheffield's lab, uh, where uh, volunteers from the music department will work to uh, under um, uh, safe conditions under a, a hood, uh, a biosafety hood. They will uh, pool the, uh, the samples together, keep track of what's being pooled with, who, who is being pooled with whom. And, uh, and then the uh, uh, Dr. Sheffield's lab uh, um, 
members will run those samples. And what they're looking for are several markers. Um, some of them are markers of a sufficient sample, and then some of them are RNA uh, markers of the virus itself. Uh, and then they um, look at, uh, they, they have a way of looking at the, estimating the quantity of virus that's present in any particular sample. Uh, and with that, they can make some, um, uh, uh, some ideas about uh, uh, whether a person is early or late in their disease process. So I think uh, Dr. Stenier might uh, uh, be next up talking about um, uh, some of the other particulars that we, uh, uh, that we looked at at the music school. Thanks. So can you see a title slide? All right. So uh, one of my hats is I'm an aerosol scientist uh, and that got me involved in this COVID ventilation um, effort at the university level. Uh, and, you know, my motivation for this was really to reopen campus safely and keep it open as long as possible. And uh, yeah, we'd like to publish this eventually, but that's not the major uh, motivation. So I'm gonna t tell you how small these particles are um, by some cartoon pictures here. Human hair, 70 microns. Uh, and then the blue balls here are what we would call coarse or large particles that are 10 microns in diameter. And that is the largest of the sizes of, uh, that is emitted from human speech uh, and probably from these instrumental um, activities. Then we move down to fine particles, which are the red balls at 2.5 microns or two and a half microns. The, uh, these are invisible to the eye. Uh, and they're very small, but the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus is um, 10 times or 20 times smaller than the red balls. Now, it, it's not found naked like that because when it uh, comes out of your, your mouth, it's it got saliva and water and proteins and salts, and then that dries over time into a collection of, of material that contains the uh, virus, but that's not, it's not just virus. So we've been thinking of these smallest particles that are like the size of the tip of my mouse, uh, and they behave in air sort of like smoke. It's the similar size of particles as cigarette smoke. So my reality check when I run one of these models that I'll show you is if a person was smoking in a one corner of a room, uh, could I smell it in the other corner of the room? The four main transmission modes that we've been thinking about at the university are uh, contaminated surfaces that you could touch. And then if you touch your mouth, eyes, or mucous membranes, that would be transmission. Then we have the uh, short range ballistic droplets these big blue balls that are falling out with gravity. Those are the ones that don't make it farther than the uh, two meters in under most conditions. Then we have the short range airborne. So this is when you're in someone else's breath cloud. And then that breath cloud gets diluted and diluted. And then those particles still exist in the room and can be breathed in the long range uh, airborne route. The long range airborne routes, the one that I'm most qualified to calculate, uh, and that's the one I've been calculating. And it's only important when you have high emission rates or poorly ventilated spaces. And music is a high emission rate activity and some of your spaces are not particularly well ventilated. So that's why my work has been relevant. Um, at Iowa, 
I got started in April with this ventilation subcommittee. Then I started testing filter materials in my lab for emergency mask manufacturing. Uh, in May, I made a spreadsheet model where you can plug in the air changes per hour and how many people are wearing masks uh, and get some idea of sort of relative safety of different rooms. And that was used to support university-wide policy on upgrading all the filters from MERV 6, which is sort of a medium quality filter, to MERV 13, which are the highest quality filters that will fit in our air handlers, uh, not to hold classes in the uh, rooms with no mechanical ventilation, the 50% occupancy reduction in the classrooms, uh, and other decisions that Katie Rossman in, in facilities management has been making about sort of, you know, pre ventilating spaces by running the air handlers, people get there, that sort of thing. Uh, in May, June, and July, we, were, we tested airflow in different rooms using carbon dioxide as a tracer. <laughs> if, uh, I, I love children and babies, but if, um, if they could be muted for the presentation, that'd be great. Um, in May, June, and uh, sorry, in June, we upgraded the spreadsheet to include in food And then in July, I got involved in some building specific consulting like in Voxman. Uh, uh, there was a Daily Iowan article about our work. This is what the mask testing looked like. We took an N95 uh, Chinese mask, uh, put it in a box. Uh, along with a blank, put a lot of particles in that box and see how many can penetrate the mask. And this mask worked, it was like 98% effective. And so that would be, if the mask fit perfectly on your face, that would be the level of protection that you would get. So for Voxman, I just, I have to say, Jaime Voxman, bachelor's in chemical engineering from University of Iowa, as well as his masters. So go chemical engineers. Um, so music is special uh, because of the emission rate. And this is highly uncertain uh, based on pre-publication data, but I just look at this graph, not talking, the emission rate is 60 to 80 times less than loud talking, singing, shouting, or coughing. So for the rest of the university, we're, we're trying to make classrooms safe for groups of people that are mostly not talking. It's like one instructor, a few students, and then a lot of people not talking. So the emission rates that the university is trying to make lecture halls safe for is down here around like five. Uh, for your performance spaces, it's 20 times harder to make them safe if these emissions, which are uncertain, are, are correct. Uh, so what I did was step one, tour the building, talk with Tammy and Adam, figure out what the problem was, uh, get air flows from uh, the designer of the building and the floor plans. I revised this virus bi balance model that we use to accommodate these short bursts of, of playing where you start in a clean space and then you contaminate it with your uh, aerosols and then you leave and over time it will clean out to look at these issues of how long does a room have to rest before it could be uh, reused for the next practice. Um, these are this my lab notebook, tape measure down within the practice rooms. Uh, this is the floor plan of the practice rooms. Uh, and then this is what the model output looks like with uh, the x-axis is time in minutes, and so this is four hours. Uh, and the y-axis is virus concentration. And so the scenario here is a contagious student goes into a practice room, starts singing at time zero, the virus builds up, they decide to take a break. They open the door, walk out into the hallway, that leaks a bunch of air out into the hallway that in includes virus. The other practice rooms are having their doors opened and that's bringing a little bit of contaminated virus laden air into those practice rooms. 
So then we um, calculate the dose to the lung for all these hypothetical people, calculate the infection risk and add it up. Uh, and here's what, here are the concentrations. So business was, as usual is nobody's thinking about COVID, uh, taking normal breaks, no air cleaners, uh, lots of doors opening and closing in the uh, practice area. And this is the concentration in the practice room. This is the concentration in the hallway outside of the con practice room. And then you can't see them because they're so small. They're like a hundred times lower would be the concentrations in a typical grocery store or a U of I lecture hall. And the bottom line is under business of, as usual, if one contagious person uses your practice rooms, that would lead to 0.48 new infections, which I felt was unacceptable. And so we started looking at what combination of air purifiers, rest periods, and limitations to the practice duration uh, would be needed to get it below 0.1. Uh, and we got up to 0 0.04 new infections per practice session. Uh, and I repeated that for private lessons in faculty offices, which is a, li it was a little bit more complicated model because of there's more rooms involved, more air flows. Your offices do have return air uh, so that all had to be taken into account. But the bottom line was the business as usual case. One contagious student practicing fills that room with aerosol, as well as the hallway, as well as the other rooms on the same hallway. And now you can see these are, you know, this is 0.7 units and this is 0 0.03, right? And this is 0 0.01 and it's going down and down but they actually fill the whole building with virus. Uh, and the blue line here is a typical U of I lecture hall. And this leads to 1.6 infections per contagious student lesson, right? Which is, uh, that's your sort of baseline risk. Uh, and that was a pretty high number uh, and showed the challenge of trying to I was willing to try to engineer these studio offices for safe practices, but it was going to be quite a big lift uh, because we've got to reduce this by like a factor of 100 through some combination of plexiglass barriers and special airflows and bell covers and masks. And um, I think the decision was made to just move the practices to safer spaces with better ventilation and, and the ability to separate people by a, a longer distance. And so I documented my results uh, in pretty detailed memos and have full records of all my uh, assumptions that I made. So in summary, um, you got about 150 students, I believe, that uh, in brass, voice, and wind. Uh, and if they practice every day uh, at, you know, currently, the University of or Iowa State's move-in testing was 2% of their students were, were infected, right? And so 2% of 150 means you have three. It's a reasonable assumption to assume that you're starting this semester with three infected brass, woodwind, and voice players. And if they practice every day in your practice rooms, then you get 0.12 new student infections per day. Uh, from just the practice rooms. Um, and that's uh, after the, uh, that's if you follow all the uh, guidelines in terms of running the air purifiers and the rest periods and keeping people out of the hallway where your aerosol producers are practicing. Uh, the faculty studios, if you go through the same thing, it's five new infections per week, and those are concentrated among the faculty, right? The, the person who's most likely to be infected is the person who's in the room with the contagious player, right? And then the next most at-risk person is the student who's right after them. And then that behind them is anybody who's in that same hallway 
uh, the general risk to the whole building is quite low. That's all I got. But I hope there's questions. Can I make just a point about our uh, mitigation strategy? Uh, here at the University of Iowa, I don't know if you can see on your screen there, but uh, we are compelled to use a face shield. Some people, there's some debate as to whether a face shield may be better than a mask. It does provide some eye protection, uh, but it's thought that those micro particles are perhaps not kept out of the nose and mouth as well as if you're using a mask. They have masks that have face shields built into them. And then the N95s that are very uncomfortable, hard to breathe and hard to speak around. But at the university, we go over the top. Everybody wears a face shield and a mask. And it's done in part to make things safe, but also to give the perception that we've done all we can. And it's a safe place that people that need to come to the hospital can still come to the hospital and not be frightened by it. From what all that uh, Tammy and, and Charlie and Adam and others have done for the Voxman School, I have a lot more confidence in what's going to happen while they're at school than I do when they're not at school. And so I think most of the problem is not going to happen with exposure at the school. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't work very hard to diminish their exposure at school as much as possible, but their real problem is outside of school. So the National Basketball Association with their bubble has been successful beyond anybody's imagination. They haven't tested positive despite thousands of tests on lots of basketball players because they've been successfully in a bubble. Unfortunately, the um, music students, I don't think are gonna be capable of being kept in a bubble at the Voxman School of Music. They're gonna be around town where the real danger is. Great, very good. I will chime in here again. So um, before we walk through the policies document and then open the floor to questions, um, if we could just all join me in virtually thanking our, I've been calling them the dream team that has been working uh, just incredibly hard all summer. So please, please join me in, in a virtual applause, if you will, 